Thank you all for standing by and welcome to the Aquatic Invasive Species Webinar Series, Building a Better Water Garden Webinar, hosted by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Networks Organisms and Trade Project. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today are Greg Heitzroth, Heidi Natura, and Bob Kirshner. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I would like to take a few minutes uh, for the webinar viewers to get you familiar with the technology. During our presentations, all of you will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentations, feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen. After each presentation, I will collect and pose your questions. If time allows, towards the end of the hour, we will continue with more questions. Also, if you have any technical questions at any time, please feel free to use the chat feature. Uh, one thing I did want to point out, to view all presentations fully, uh, please, if you could, go up to uh, toward the top left hand of your screen to view, and it should say drop, uh, there's a drop down to fit to viewer. If you could do that, that would be great. Uh, we have more than 50 participants on this webinar, a great diverse group representing individuals and programs from the Great Lakes and around the country. Uh, please keep the questions going throughout the presentations and we should have uh, some great Q&A sessions. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant uh, website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature towards the end of the presentation. Uh, please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill that survey. Uh, so without any further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Greg Heitzroth from Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Greg has been leading Illinois Indiana Sea Grant's OIT, or Organisms in uh, Trade, uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative project for the past year, which focuses on outreach programming for aquarium hobbyists and water gardeners. Prior to this appointment, he was with the Chicago Botanic Gardens for three years working with citizen scientists. We are delighted to have Greg here today to begin the webinar by providing an overview of the OIT project. Uh, Greg, I am going to unmute you and uh, make you a presenter. Hold on one second. Okay, Greg, you should be good to go. All right. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick overview. So the topics in today's webinar will cover a quick background of aquatic invasive plants and organisms in trade, uh, principles of water garden design using native species, and examples of commonly used invasive plants and water gardens and their alternatives. Uh, there was a webinar on Tuesday where we covered what it means to be an aquatic invasive plant, how potential invasiveness is measured through risk assessments, and methods for preventing the spread of organisms from water gardens to public waters. And as Jill mentioned, um, this will also be published on the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant website. So if you're interested in that, that will also be on the website there. Um, in April this year, a workshop about preventing the introduction and spread of aquatic invasive plants into public waters through water gardens was held at the Chicago Botanic Garden. The purpose of this webinar series is to broadcast the information presented at that workshop to a Great Lakes wide audience. <clears throat> the webinar, this webinar series is funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and I want to thank the Chicago Botanic Garden, Bob Kirscher, and Heidi Natura for participating in today's webinar. Um, and so with that, I will go into my hopefully very quick uh, presentation about an overview of organisms and trade, just to put some context onto this webinar today. Um, so first I have to talk about aquatic invasive plants. Uh, typically these species are introduced from outside their natural geographic range, such as purple loosestrife, was introduced from Europe into the United States. Um, you can see the distribution map um, here. Uh, they cause ecological or economic harm. Purple loosestrife has been shown to create an annual loss of 200,000 acres of wetlands per year and an annual cost of about $48 million to control, but also there's a loss of forage and waterfowl habitat. Uh, they are typically introduced through human activities, such as unintentional introductions. Um, purple loosestrife has been suggested to be introduced through uh, shipping of seeds from Europe uh, intention, un unintentionally, um, but also uh, seeds sticking to livestock fur. But there's also the intentional introduction, such as through ornamentals. Um, it was introduced as an ornamental in the 1800s, but there's also the unintentional spread into aquatic habitats from um, intentional ornamental use. 
and that kind of leads into uh, organisms and trade pathways. So essentially, it's the intentional use of uh, species for trade, um, but there's also the aquatic invasive usage of uh, certain plants and animals. And so specifically, these pathways of introduction are water gardens, aquariums, live bait, aquaculture, live food, and biological supply houses. And for this presentation, um, really, we're focusing on water gardens. Um, <clears throat> in the previous webinar, we discussed a lot of the ways in which people can prevent the spread of uh, invasive species um, from water gardens. And in this presentation, we're going to focus a lot on uh, when you add plants to your water garden, choose regionally native or non-weedy plants to kind of uh, prevent the introduction of new species or even the spread of existing invasive species. And with that, I will leave it to Heidi and Bob um, for the rest of the presentation, I believe. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Greg. I would like to now uh, introduce our second speaker, Heidi Natura, who is the founder and partner of Living Habitats, a Chicago-based consulting firm specializing in landscape architecture, ecological services, environmental planning, and custom artworks. Uh, her special focus area includes natural areas restoration, natural area restoration, and vegetative uh, roof projects. Heidi, I am going to um, unmute you and um, put your PowerPoint presentation on and give hand you the ball. Wonderful. Uh, good day to all, and uh, thank you for joining us. I would like to mention um, after the introduction that. Our best work really happens when we're combining uh, very carefully our four service offerings into all of our project work. And I believe it's something that needs to be given quite a bit more attention where we're not isolating design services from ecological considerations. And thus, uh, it's where we begin all of our projects. Uh, I, I'm here today really to highlight several things. Uh, our work with the Botanic Garden over the last many years, restoring several miles of their lake shorelines, as well as highlighting several smaller projects that uh, focus on, on water shorelines or water gardens in particular. And to dive right in, let me see if I can get my slides to move. We can do better than this is the, the kickoff to my discussion. Sadly, this type of aesthetic and environment is seen far too frequently in the landscape. And it's the result in large part of either uh, regulatory requirements to create detention basins such as this, but also from an impetus or a need from people, I believe, to create water features to enjoy and surround themselves with quote unquote nature. And uh, sadly, we're, we're left wanting significantly in this particular application as in many on both an aesthetic front, uh, that, that earth connection front, as well as ecological value. I'm also uh, feeling that we can do better than this. Uh, this is a very classic water garden that you would find in many residential settings especially. And I'm going to use this example to deconstruct some of the aesthetic considerations uh, for the, the rest of my talk. So we'll keep coming back to this particular example. This is an image of one of the Chicago Botanic Gardens shoreline restoration projects that we worked on. And I'd like to highlight here the ability of native flora to perform for us in the shoreline setting and provide a, a wonderful backdrop and integration and transition into more stylized and often uh, you know, very showy uh, garden design options that are deployed throughout formal gardens or residential gardens or gardens of any type. And here the, the public has an opportunity to look down onto these shorelines in juxtaposition with these other ornamental landscapes and appreciate not only sort of a calming, quieting backdrop, a relief in the eye from the busy and bright colors that often go along with those highly cultivated gardens, uh, but also provide, as you can see from the egret, lounging and, and strolling in this shoreline setting, incredibly important habitat. This is an image of historic Illinois. And in my opinion, it's often what a water garden creation is seeking. Uh, these pockets 
of open water that reflect the sky and provide that serene calm that we so long for, uh, interspersed with emergent vegetation, possibly floating, floating leaf vegetation, and then surrounded by uh, a vegetated shoreline that can transition into other habitats and gardens or potentially a turf lawn or other surrounding landscape. And this particular setting um, is, might be sought after from a standpoint of a design perspective, but often is not necessarily well understood as to how you achieve that combination of open water and vegetation in a, a larger landscape fabric. This cross-section represents that prior image, and what we see from a bathymetric or bottom of, uh, of a water body standpoint is undulating pockets, some shallower that can relate very clearly to emergent vegetation. It's happiest often in water that's anywhere from uh, a few inch or no inches deep to a few inches deep to maybe as much as six to 12 inches deep. And then moving into your floating leaved aquatics, which can come into much deeper water, three feet and more. And yet we want to leave some of these areas open, deeper pockets to actually be able to appreciate the water and the investment, the great investment in creating uh, water, uh, water landscapes. The, um, there's a question that came up about how old is this particular image? And this was taken the first season after our initial installation. And the aquatic uh, installation, or pardon me, the aquatic species in particular often amaze uh, people in terms of just how fast they established, how lush and, and verdant they can be in a very short period of time. Essentially, they have the advantage over the terrestrial landscape of being continuously irrigated. And so they really can just leap out of the gate. And I think the upslope plantings in this case are, are particularly lush and um, lovely because they were installed at a very, very large size. So to come back to that cross-section and, and looking at what we're trying to replicate from um, a, an existing, or I should say an ecosystem reference point of view, all these off-the-shelf options are available in terms of the liners and the rocks and the pumps and the plants and how they can come together to create a system that might realize this, this idea of beauty that people have in their minds. And I think what's lacking is the encouragement of the wide range of plant material that can be very appropriate and applicable in those settings, as well as an understanding of what's really needed to create some of that open water. How do you maintain those open water pockets? If you want floating leaved aquatic plants, how deep do you really need to be? If you want emergent plants, how shallow do you really need to be? So we have a, a long way to go in the nursery industry and in the supplier industry to help people understand what the, it is that they're actually trying to create and realizing that creation. This is an overview of the aesthetic considerations that I'm going to continue to go over for the rest of my talk. And I'm going to dive right into scale and form. Uh, but we'll also be touching on seasonal interest, color and accent, and this idea of having a calm and sophisticated versus chaotic and busy landscape. So to our subject garden of unknown location and creation, uh, we're going to, I think, attack it first on a, uh, from a standpoint of scale. And uh, the fact that this is a water garden and that you can't necessarily tell that without being right on top of it is, I think, a shortcoming. Uh, again, this idea that water is in the water garden and that there's water surface to reflect the sky can really be most realized with a, a, a minimum size paired with restraint in terms of how much vegetation you really can cram into a small space. In this particular setting, there's large expanses of turf around all sides of this garden. And if the garden had even been doubled in size, utilizing the same number of plants even, uh, we might have a much more balanced and interesting garden to be working from. From a standpoint of form, it's also all laid out in front of us. We see the entire garden, and there's nothing left to the imagination. Very little interest is added to this garden as a result of the form that it was taken were provided. 
this is a project that I'm going to come back to several times as a counterpoint to that previous slide. Uh, a small detention basin inside a condominium association here in the Chicago region. This was a very degraded condition, completely eroded slopes that were sloughing and ugly, poor water quality. And this client wanted to use native vegetation to not only recapture and restore and hold that shoreline, but also to create habitat for the enjoyment of the people who live in the, in the condominium association. So as a point of contrast from the prior slide, here we have a much better balance of water and plants. And even though this is a larger installation, you can also imagine that this can scale up or down. It's simply a matter of deciding we want a certain percentage of open water, we want a certain percentage of plant material. Also, the form uh, is more interesting in my own opinion in that it disappears from view in certain places. You're left wanting to know what's around the bend in either direction or over my shoulder uh, as, as the water continues. So that careful consideration of the shape, the, the shoreline outline uh, that you're working with in the garden can be very important. From a seasonal interest standpoint, our subject garden uh, doesn't do too bad. We've got several different evergreens and color of leaf and type of perennial and even some annuals thrown in in the front. And so there's quite a lot going on um, and maybe too much going on, but we'll get back to that. And I think um, really where I'd like to focus on with this garden is the idea of plant performance. It's comprised mostly of ornamental ornamental cultivars. And ornamental cultivars aren't necessarily known for their performance in terms of benefits to us from an ecological standpoint, certainly, but also from a standpoint of erosion control or stormwater infiltration and other uh, environmental issues that we really need to be getting added value from when we're talking about investing dollars into our landscape creations. And thus, uh, you'll see in, in the upper right here, we have sort of an exposed soil area. And my guess would be the, the performance of whatever species were there ultimately weren't paired properly with the conditions of that water garden shoreline. This is a diagram that I created many years ago. And it was intended to communicate to people the remarkable power of the, vegeta or the vegetative parts of the plants that reside below the surface, the root structures, the incredible root structures of our native flora. This is the root systems of prairie plants diagram. And you can see throughout this image the incredible fibrous roots of many of our grasses, sedges, rushes, multiple surfaces on countless root hairs that can hold soil, infiltrate water, permanently fix carbon from the air. A third of the roots die and become soil every year, and thus it's a permanent carbon sink. This is just a small sampling of, of the litany of how these plants can, can function and perform for us if we give them the chance to be a part of our landscapes. A sedge here right out of the pot, ready to go into the ground. You can see its root structure just going gangbusters, actually growing out of the bottom of the pot. As soon as that plant hits the ground, it's going to start sending that root network around and providing all those benefits I just outlined. And this is a close-up of that diagram that also highlights here many of our flowering plants, our forbs, do not have the fibrous root systems like the grasses, sedges, rushes do. And therefore, we can't rely on them solely. Even though we may be mostly attracted to them from their beautiful blooms, we need to integrate the other species into the mix to be able to gain those functional benefits. And this is especially important if we're targeting native plants to our erosive shoreline edges. We must have grasses, sedges, rushes a part of that uh, planting in order to have erosional protection. This is another example of one of the shorelines here at the Chicago Botanic Garden that we created, where you've got a full cross-section of emergent vegetation, the pickerel weed on the right side of the graphic, and then stepping up to uh, basically a higher, drier upland condition on the left. 
So things that range, uh, like such as butterfly weed and uh, wild mint and things that would never grow within the water, but because many of our shorelines end up being relatively steep, need to be a part of that package, a part of the consideration when you're talking about developing a plant list that would be appropriate for shoreline restoration, especially man-made shorelines. The use of accent and color, back on our subject garden, uh, I probably am most offended by this particular design because everything is an accent. When you don't have large expanses of resting green, of similar texture, you end up being scattered and a little disjointed, and there's not that calming feeling as you're looking at this design. It's almost excitable. And there's, I, I think, just overall a lack of restraint in terms of how color is used. There's a lot of color going on, as well as this idea that your color can be so much more effectively used if it's treated as an accent in and amongst this backdrop of green vegetation. And back to the, the detention basin retrofit, we have smaller groupings in the front and in the background of native species that have incredibly gorgeous blooms, especially when you view them up close. They're, they're exceptionally beautiful. And yet, if they were planted everywhere along this shoreline, their luster and, and um, emphasis and accent and purpose would really be lost, as well as not working. Because like I mentioned previously, we really need this green backdrop of other highly functioning and performing plants to make these gardens work. So this idea I'm trying to drive home about calm and sophisticated versus chaotic and busy. Again, if you're intending to invest in these types of landscapes, I think being really clear about what your goal is when you start can help to define some of those parameters and then applying that restraint. It's so fun to use all the different plants that are available to us and that are promoted but having a smaller palette or a larger scale to allow for more species to be utilized is an important, uh, I think, distinguisher between an amateur effort and a professional effort. On a slight digression here, the same thing can be said for inert materials that would be used and applied in uh, a water garden setting. This isn't by far the worst example that I could find on how stone is often deployed uh, to stabilize shorelines and, and often as accent. But a lot can be said for the very careful placement of stone and the reference of where that stone came from out of the earth, how it was deployed. If it's sedimentary, it should probably be laid in long horizontal bands that are parallel to the earth's grade. If it's uh, glacial erratics, like in this particular situation, size can be very important where you don't necessarily want to put smaller stones under larger stones. It leaves you with a sense of disease and not knowing really about the stability of that shoreline. As a counterpoint, again, here at the Botanic Garden, we use large boulders very, in a very restrained fashion as accents to help break up some of the, the plantings and to provide their own form of stabilization. One trick involved with uh, setting stones, not only beyond, I should say, considering that idea of how they're laid on the earth, is also to bury the stone. A good two-thirds of the stones in these cases are buried below the surface to give them that sense of having always been there and emerging out of the Earth's surface. Drifts of plants running parallel to the normal water line is actually how the plants are deployed in the wild. Many of these species that we've talked about have very narrow bands that they can live in. This particular graphic is one of the shoreline planting plans uh, here at the Botanic Garden. And you can see longer linear drifts that essentially follow contours of, that relate to subsurface and above water grades. And if you don't deploy your plant material in those fashions, you can often be left with plants that don't survive because you haven't had the right pairing. Here in, in practice, back at our other sample garden, you can see in the foreground this zone of Sara sernuis in the front, very happy in its proper water depth along the front of this retaining wall. And then stepping up behind it, several other drifts of species that are much more comfortable with a higher and drier uh, uh, ground plane. 
So paying very close attention to that and working with these long drifts along the grades can again create a very calm and seated application of both plants and uh, even inert material. And then to drive home the idea of not being afraid of having quiet, calm, green species as your backdrop, they can also be accents. In this image, you can see all the different forms of leaf that provide a lot of visual interest. And in the foreground, there's penstemon in bloom that can then jump off that green backdrop as if it was a canvas. So relying on the native plant material in large part to create these backdrops and then gain almost by default some of the functional benefits that I'd been highlighting can really be a nice way to bridge maybe the unfamiliar with native plants and not necessarily sure if they're going to like them, especially if they haven't been promoted to a point where people know them at all. If we get a comfort level and have an understanding that a portion of a water garden should always be sedges, simply from a standpoint of functional performance, but then the added benefit of a much calmer and more interesting aesthetic as well. And that wraps up my portion of the presentation, so I'm, I'm happy to take some specific questions at this point. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Heidi. I think uh, we've gotten uh, several uh, good questions that I want to relay to you. Um, the first question is, I've heard that even native plants for water gardens may have invasive plants, animals, or seeds in their root balls. How can we know that native aquatic plants are not carrying invasives? I guess, Heidi, if you could ask, answer that question, and then if Bob or Greg want to pipe in as well. Sure. Uh, we can't. Um, and honestly, the native plants, whether they come in on nursery stock, or they simply wander into your site from surrounding properties that have been invaded already, they will always be there. I think the onus is on us to keep our eyes open for them and then to have an, a, an approach of no mercy. When we see them, we need to remove them. And so I, I think the nursery industry in general has a fairly high bar, and I, it's rare, I can say from my own personal experience, when an invasive species would come in on a nursery stock but I don't necessarily uh, think that that's an, an impossible uh, reality. From the water gardening perspective and a lot of the uh, things like water lilies and the emergent plants, and I think, Greg, you can grab the ball here in a second or grab the microphone, but there are some techniques that are recommended to try and cleanse the roots of many of the plants that aren't really in soil, to especially some of the smaller floating leaf plants like azola and things like that that uh, we are to the best of our ability trying to keep out of our waterways as Heidi said we can't be perfect so as the installation proceeds to really keep our eyes peeled for these but Greg you may want to comment more uh, no I mean you guys mostly got it so usually what we suggest is that people rinse the roots once they purchase a plant from a nursery or online dealer, um, but also dispose of any water or debris from those roots into uh, the middle of a lawn where they probably wouldn't potentially survive, so away from like so stream, I mean, uh, storm drains and stuff like that. So we also push like a little bit of uh, proper disposal of hanger honors or hitchhikers. As you guys are speaking about the aquatic species, certainly there's, there's things that can be done. It's a little more challenging when you're talking about plants that demand soil on the root. And therefore, those species, I, I think having that, that careful look, weed as you go approach is, is very important, especially the first few years after the establishment uh, of, the, of the garden. Definitely, yeah, that is very important. Okay, thanks, Heidi and everyone. Uh, uh, one other question. Uh, uh, the city where I live was prone to flooding so many years ago. They had the the stream bed bulldozed flat. Many banks were turned into concrete, and those that were left were sloped and planted with grass. How do we address municipalities who are reluctant to restore the shoreline in flood control project areas? And I guess I would say Heidi for this. There's been an evolution in thinking as it relates to civil engineering 
although I believe that that particular area of practice has been a little slower coming on. Their primary objective clearly is to make sure people don't flood. And it's secondary, certainly, if ever considered, to have an ecological aspect to flood control projects in particular. There's also many other challenges for flood control projects from a standpoint of impact. These are not natural systems. Most of our existing rivers really, if you want to be perfectly blunt, are open sewers. And to keep native plants out of them, or I'm sorry, invasive plants out of those uh, areas is a constant and ongoing task. And so it's easy to see how people default to non-ecologically based solutions. And yet there's a definite movement, at least in the Chicago area, for people to put a lot of energy and resources into restoring both our riverways, but also detention basins, as in the case of this project still up on the screen, or other zones. And so it's really a matter of making, a, as a constituency, making it known to regulators and government agencies that it's not what we have to settle for. And in many cases, there can be other creative thought applied. But the professionals in charge have to be held to task, and uh, many of them, I think, aren't necessarily interested in exploring some of those ideas. There are many more that are, and I think finding the, the professionals that are willing to explore how to pair an ecosystem design solution to a very functional, performing landscape uh, is, is where you would need to spend your attention. Who in your area really does do this type of work, and can they become more involved in solving, uh, say, a municipal contract or, or other government agencies contract for a solution. Okay, thanks Heidi. Uh, we have a couple more questions, but I'll save those until the end. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce uh, our third speaker. Bob Kirshner is the Chicago Botanic Garden Gardens uh, Curator for of Aquatic Plant and Urban Lake Studies and its Director of Restoration Ecology. The garden's landscape includes a 20, or I'm sorry, a 60-acre system of lakes. And since 1999, Bob has overseen the garden's uh, rejuvenation of 4.5 miles of lakeshore, utilizing bioengineering. to talk about aquatic plants. It's one of my favorite things to, to work with others on. And what I'd like to do is to expand on what Heidi's introduction to water garden and shoreline edge design and talk about some of the plants that um, we think are great candidates for both water gardens as well as for naturalized shorelines and compare those and offer alternatives to a number of species that have been identified as being uh, invasive in the environment and something that we'd like to see the industry and those who use water gardens and natural shorelines to move av away from those plantings. So we're just going to jump right in. Uh, these are in no particular order, but what I'll be explaining are uh, invasive plants and then alternatives that we feel offer either the color or the form or the function the ecological function uh, that those invasive plants might have been intended to try to provide. So our first one here is a flowering rush. Um, this is a uh, commonly available ornamental plant. It's been found to be aggressive uh, in some natural environments. It's fairly difficult to uh, remove. And we like to suggest folks consider as an alternative, something like Juncus effusus, the common rush, this is a great water garden plant in a few inches of water, up to even six inches of water, but it's especially if you're trying to work on naturalized shorelines of lakes and rivers, um, it's a semi-evergreen plant. And so the image you see there on the left of the leaf structure and the seed heads, much of that remains even in our uh, temperate climate here, for 12 months. It will die back somewhat in the wintertime, but that plant is offering you 12 months of protection because the leaves really don't die all the way back to the water line or 
below, that plant gives you 12 months of protection for wave types of erosion. Another one, if you like to fish a lot, you know you often cast your lure into a bed of hard stem bulrush, um, very up, upright in its form. This plant does well once it's established in even uh, more than one foot of water. Um, another smaller, um, uh, this, these used to be called scurpus, now they've been reclassified as Xenoplectus pungens, but this bulrush does very well at the wet edge. It'll creep upslope from the wet edge and into a few inches of water as well. And then the soft stem bulrush, a little bit more arching in its form than the hard stem bulrush, but again, very, very ornamental in its appearance and very upright. It's probably one of the taller plants that you'll be able to introduce to your aquatic landscape. Now let's jump to another one of the bad guys here, European frog bit. Uh, is a very invasive plant. It has floating leaves, as does the yellow floating heart up in the northeast United States. This is a very problematic plant, and it's starting to become much more of a problem here in the upper mid Midwest as well. The design intent here was to have a, a floating leaf plant with some color. So let's try and find alternatives to that. The, Yellow pond lily, um, sometimes it's called spatter dock. The Nufar genus uh, has a couple varieties. The yellow flower here, not the most ornamental, but it, it really does pop out in the landscape, this little ball of a flower that you see, the lower right-hand corner. That's as big as that's going to get, but it really has a very pretty leaf. And then our um, native Water lace is the only native water lily, at least in our region of the United States. Uh, the white water lily, if you see a water lily of any other color than white in the Chicago region and upper Midwest, it's not native and you probably, if it's in a naturalized water setting, would want to get that out of there. Now some upright plants, very upright uh, in its form, the iris, Pseudacarus or Pseuda, Pseudacorus, depending on which school of Latin you come from. Yellow iris uh, can be very problematic. This slide shows um, just how aggressive this plant can become. In the Chicago region itself, it's not quite at this <coughs> stage, but it's getting there. It, it is really starting to creep into more and more of our naturalized wet, wetland areas. We think there's some very beautiful alternatives. It has the exact same leaf form, maybe not quite as robust and tall, but the iris first color, iris virginica, they're just coming out of bloom now, and we were commenting the other day, this is one of the best years for water iris than we can remember. They uh, apparently do like the cooler, wetter springs that, that we uh, had this year. And another plant that looks like iris, but it's not, is uh, Acris americanus, the sweet flag, has the same leaf, a rather nondescript, um, uh, seed head and flower. Sometimes we found that the wildlife do like to eat it. Uh, the iris that I had on the previous screen here, the, we have yet to find a muskrat that wants to mow this stuff down, but the muskrats do on occasion mow our acris down. It's got a very sweet smelling leaf. If That's how you can differentiate it very easily from the iris. The acris has a actually very nicely smelling uh, sweet aroma to it. Some other more grass-like appearing plants, the Glycerium maxima is an invasive species, but we have wonderful alternatives. The wide range of sedges, the Carex, Carex camosa, the bristly sedge which, with its very interesting seed head, um, Carex lacustris has been a strong performer for us here at the garden, likes the wet edge and will tolerate a number of inches of water and if the soil in the near shore or edge of your water garden is moist it will creep up into there as well. Carex stricta, if you recall I was talking and singing the virtues of the juncus effusus, the soft rush, and how effective that is at protecting wind swept shorelines for 12 months out of the year. Carex stricta does the same thing. It forms these tussocks, hence its common name, 
tussock sedge that provides a wonderful barrier against waves when we don't have much above uh, waterline living green material in November and December and January and February when the ice comes out, these tussocks do a great job of protecting the shoreline from waves. Here's our poster child oftentimes of invasive wetland taxa, the purple loosestrife. Of course, like so many of our invasive plants, they're easy to grow and they're beautiful, but um, I think given a little time and experience with our native plants, we can grow to like them just as much. So if you're after the purple of purple loosestrife, well consider the swamp milkweed. Very beautiful color in the flower and in the seed heads are extremely interesting as well. I'll just add a side note, if you heard about the really difficult times the monarch butterflies have had over the past few years, and they had a very difficult time this past winter in their overwintering grounds down in Mexico. If you thought about adding milkweed to your garden, this could be the year to do it, folks, because the monarch butterflies are, are really needing some help. The swamp loosestrife, Decadon verticillatus, has been a really great plant for us to incorporate along the garden's lake edges. It has a semi-woody stem, and this picture doesn't quite show it, but a very lovely arching uh, characteristic to it, and then those stems will get adventitious roots that grow into the water. It can really soften um, uh, the edges of plants, and I've deployed it with great success even in small water gardens. You can plant three or four plugs of Decadon fertilis in a small pot, put it at the edge of your water garden, and within a month you'll see these stems trailing off. Uh, we have a comment from one of our viewers that's found swamp milkweed to be the best performing plant for attracting butterflies and will draw swallowtails in addition to the monarchs. Thank you for adding that. Here's another invasive, the European water clover floating on the surface of the water and extending up, up, up above it as well. Um, something that doesn't quite float on the water but stays close to the water, kind of hugs that uh, water surface appearance is the American water willow, Justitia americana. Uh, that's a little hard in our naturalized shorelines. It, it takes a few years to get a to get established, but once it does, it takes off quite nicely. Here's another poster child of our wetlands, uh, reed canary grass, and boy, is this a booger to try and get on top of. There's variegated ornamental cultivars of it as well. Um, our experience has shown is that they're all they're all bad. They're all nasty to try and manage and get a hold of, or get uh, get con get control over rather. Um, you want to do your very best to keep this out of your water garden, out of your shoreline la landscape, because once it gets in there, it's very difficult to control. The way we handle it is we hand wick with uh, herbicides that are registered for right along the shoreline there, and we try and catch these, catch these infestations as soon as they appear. But a very attractive um, native plant. This is easy to grow. It's almost impossible to kill. Our prairie cord grass will grow in a number of inches of water and will move up the shoreline as well and actually does surprisingly well even in droughty conditions. Um, a very strong performing plant. Our cattails. Uh, there's narrow leaf cattail uh, which we believe most of it is a genotype that did not originate here in North America. It came from from Europe and Asia. Uh, it's very aggressive. It is hybridized with our native broadleaf cattail, uh, but probably most of what you see, especially if it's growing uh, very aggressively, is this invasive genotype of the typha and gust and, and gust folia. We have a very low tolerance for cattails of any form here at the garden because unless you do the genetic identification, it's very difficult to know exactly what you've got. But there's another plant, a native plant, looks almost exactly like the cattail. Same upright broad leaves, very interesting seed head as you can see. Um, our Sparganium uricarpin, the common burr reed, is a great plant. 
Right, now we have a couple of troubling plants uh, for a couple reasons. The water hyacinth. Folks love this plant and it's easy to understand why. If you got a tub, you can throw this plant in the tub in your backyard, put some water in it, the dog will maybe drink some water out of it, but this plant is going to grow some beautiful purple uh, flowers for for you. Another one very common for water gardens is the water lettuce. It floats on the surface. The problem is that these, even though they are, have not been found to be invasive from a perennial basis, yet here in the Chicago region we are seeing overwintering populations, especially of the water hyacinth. But we have seen situations where even as in growing as an annual in our naturalized waterways, these two plants, the water hyacinth and the water lettuce, can be a problem. So why do I have question marks here for you? We really don't have, this is about the only category this falls into, a really great native alternative that has that same floating leaved uh, habit that can't kill it practically, uh, uh, viability in the water garden, we're, because of its known and potential invasiveness, we're asking folks to see if they can just get past it. And if it's something that needs to float, uh, you could introduce a little bit of duckweed, but it's hard to have a little bit of duckweed if you've had, if you've seen it in larger ponds, it tends to spread fairly aggressively, but you can introduce a little bit of that to a water garden or a water tub if you have a very small water garden feature. And if it's the purple in the water hyacinth you are after, well, introduce the pickerel weed, Pontideria cordata, a great native. This plant uh, won't withstand having its tuber frozen, so it needs to be in an environment of at least eight, maybe even 12 inches of water or more so that it can become hardy right through the winter. We'll move on to a couple of the sub of the submerged plantings like the invasive cabamba, Brazilian elodea. Um, these are oftentimes introduced into aquariums and water gardens. Uh, something in particular that's taken a, quite a bit of notice now in the upper Midwest is the, hyd is the hydrilla plant. It's a um, submerged plant and it has been found all around Illinois, in Wisconsin, Indiana, up in the Northeast, in New York. It hasn't arrived in Illinois yet, but we've just launched a very aggressive effort. I encourage you, if you have a moment, to write down that website you see on your screen. To go learn more about, about hydrilla, we're asking uh, enthusiasts who are out on the water to keep their eyes out for it. There's an identification card that can help you differentiate hydrilla from, for example, the native um, American elodea. We want to find this plant as soon as it arrives in Illinois and try and eradicate it so that we can kick the can down the road as long as we possibly can of having hydrilla become in, uh, hydrilla infestations here in Illinois. Another similar plant is the non-native Myriophyllum aquaticum, the parrot feather. This plant will crawl up the size of your water garden. That's why a lot of water gardeners like it, but it is extremely invasive and has been found in naturalized environments as well. Al alternatives, or I'm sorry, one, one more um, is the Vallisneria, uh, but this is a invasive species of an otherwise uh, native taxa that we have at Vallisneria, as you'll see here in a moment. Um, native, though this plant can become aggressive, is the coontail coon plant. This plant has very weak and sometimes even no roots. It will float as blobs on your water surface. I think it can work great in a water garden setting, and if it doesn't get too out of control, is also a, a great plant in naturalized lake environments as well. This is the plant I had up earlier, the American Waterweed, the American elodea that looks very much like the um, hydrilla that we are having the hunt for, 
but this is a desirable native submerged plant. So if you're looking for submerged plants for your water garden, see if you can track down American waterweed or another name for it is American Elodea. Another great one is the sago pond pondweed. Waterfowl like this, this plant does not grow extremely quickly, and so uh, it, it, it's a good alternative. Here's the native uh, species of the Vallisneria, the wild celery, uh, very attractive leaves. If you're introducing it to naturalized environments, it's a pretty picky plant. may not be the first one that you try and introduce, but it's a nice one as well. Now I'm just going to go through at the end here a, a few plants that we found just to be careful with. The native Alisma subcordatum has almost a baby's breath type of a flower, but produces many, many seeds. And if you don't want this plant all over the place after it's done flowering, you may want to deadhead this plant so that you don't have this plant throughout your shoreline landscape. Uh, a plant we really like folks to consider, the Caltha palustris got them blooming uh, about a month or so ago, the marsh marigold. It'll be the first hint of color you have along your shorelines, both for water gardens as well as naturalized lakes and rivers. We think it's a great plant. The needle spike rush, these very diminutive um, spike rushes you'll see. You can buy this as, as seed and sprinkle it along the edge of your water garden or of your uh, lake environment and provides a great um, fill-in between plants. Queen of the Prairie, who can't like the look of that plant? You want this just slightly above the water line. It looks very well positioned with some of the other sedges and rushes. Um, hibiscus, some folks are very surprised to find there are native hibiscus. The large bloom, the large leaves can be a rather dramatic addition to your landscape. Lobili cardinalis, one of the poster childs for native plantings. This likes very moist soil. It's a short-lived per perennial, uh, basically a biennial, and so if you introduce this plant along your edge, you'll, you may want to help it by re-sowing the seeds after the um, plant has gone into flower and produced its seed. You can hand harvest those seeds, sprinkle them along the wet edge, make sure they don't get covered though with too much soil or the seeds aren't going to grow. It's more um, robust perhaps cousin, the Lobelia syphilitica, the great blue Lobelia, even grows in a bit of shade. It's not quite as tricky to get established as the cardinal flower, the red lob Lobelia is. Peltandra has uh, its arrow arum has a wonderful sort of arrowhead, heart-shaped leaf, um, grows nice, thick clumps, takes a few years to get established, a great water garden plant, I think. Um, also, Rumex verticillatus, the swamp dock, in mass, it can look quite uh, attractive along a shoreline, has interesting seed heads, and even added in a few plugs to a pot in a water garden can be attractive as well. Another poster child of wetland and shoreline environments is the common arrowhead, our, Sag our Sagittaria with the very distinctive shaped leaf. Um, we do find it's not called duck potato because ducks don't like it. So waterfowl uh, tend to graze pretty heavily on this plant. You might want to establish other shoreline vegetation and then after that's become established, add the Sagittaria where the waterfall may not be able to see it quite so readily. And uh, the red bull rush, Scorpus pendulus, likes to be above the waterline just slightly. Hiding the Tur and I both agree it's one of the most underappreciated native plants that belong in, every, in everyone's wet garden. It's very graceful in its form for both the leaves as well as the seed head. The verbena hostata, uh, this is a lovely plant, the purple, the f flowers, you can see the seed head, it's very dis distinctive and moving into fall and even winter it can be quite lovely. And then finally there's a few woody taxa like the indigo bush. You can see how its uh, leaves tend to f float above the la landscape and you can help that character by trimming them up a bit. Uh, the budden bush is a very is a is a very 
a popular plant. When we've made mistakes with this, it's when we've put it too close to the water's edge. Uh, it doesn't seem to like, although sometimes it does, but our experience is that it doesn't like to be all the way down in the water. Plant it just above that wet edge, and it should do great for you. The pussy willow, everybody knows these, and the catkins in the spring. If you if your uh, pussy willow gets too big for you, cut off some of the stems and pound them into the ground in the spring, and it'll grow a whole new shrub for you. And the final one I think I have here is the spirea alba, the meadow uh, sweet. Uh, we let it grow two, three, four feet high, and then we do a renewal pruning and cut it all the way back down to uh, the the bottom of the ground and let it re-sprout and you can just rejuvenate that woody shrub that way. Um, I'll finally just do a quick pitch more about what the garden's been doing along its shorelines, our four and a half miles of shoreline with a half million native plant plugs that we've added can be found at this website cbtshoreline.org. Just if this is what our shorelines looked like before we came through, pretty serious erosion. We've been marching around our lake's edge with the Spider Island, the water gardens of the Great Basin. Heidi had a picture from here before. Uh, EPA, both Illinois and U.S. EPA, helped us with our, with our work in our Japanese garden. Talk about design challenges for plants. And most recently, we just wrapped up in our North Lake with help from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, one and a quarter miles of shoreline rest restoration in these shorelines in yellow if you come to the garden. Here are the parking lots. Be sure to check out the yellow highlighted North Lake shorelines. So we've been taking shorelines that looked like this and turned them into that just a few years later, or this shoreline and turned them into that with our native plantings, and then in the Japanese garden turned this shoreline and turned it into that. So I will leave you with the final slide from our North Lake shoreline. These plants had only been in the ground about two months when the picture was taken last fall. And I'm going to tease you and say you have to come to the Botanic Garden to see what the same scene looks like now. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Jill. Thanks, Bob. Uh, we have uh, several uh, questions that I'd like to throw out. And, and I think specifically a lot of these are to you, Bob. Um, the first question is how do, and this one actually could be uh, Heidi as well, how do uh, water gardeners know which species are legal to use in each Great Lakes state or province? Are all the alternatives identified today legal for use in all jurisdictions? There is some concern that what may be legal in one jurisdiction may not be in another. That's right. Um, each of your state, either Department of Natural Resources, Department of Environmental Management in Illinois, it's Department of Natural Resources and EPA, um, these plants that I've had on the screen are all native in the, sh in the Chicago region. You would want to verify with your State Department of, Envir of Environmental Protection whether the plants are native in your zone and whether they might be deemed invasive. I also want to uh, take this moment to plug our uh, Organisms and Trade website where we are compiling a database of um, regulations for species, and so some of those are going to be plants, and so check back with the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant uh, species regulation database in a few months, and things should be going pretty smoothly. Okay, thanks, Greg and Bob. Um, another question that we have is, um, with West Nile virus continuing to be a concern in the Midwest and health departments actively asking people to remove standing water from their properties to reduce mosquito breeding, how do we make sure our water gardens do not become mosquito breeding grounds? Well, I think for, for water gardens, there are the mosquito dunks that you can purchase at the um, uh, garden centers, and that will probably help you alleviate the mosquito larvae from your water garden. As far as our shorelines and our naturalized water areas, a healthy functioning wetland and shoreline area will have the predators in it that will help keep mosquito larvae at bay. And that's why we advocate really creating native ecosystems with the, with the native plants and the native animals that can help keep some of the problematic mosquito populations at bay. It's been said that 
in the tire behind someone's garage can be more mosquitoes breeding in the water in that tire than in a whole acre of uh, healthy wetland. Okay, thanks. Um, another question is how can setting up a water garden help contribute to controlling flooding? Are there ways to construct a garden in a way that retains water and takes some of the pressure off community sewer systems? We're starting to run out of time. Probably a water garden may not be the best way to control flooding, but probably many on this webinar have heard of rain gardens, of rain gardens where the water is intentionally allowed to percolate into the ground. That can do a tremendous amount just by disconnecting one of your downspouts from your lawn that runs down to the sewer and instead routing it to a rain garden can can do a, an, an, an awful lot to reduce to reduce flooding and encourage the rainwater uh, percolation down into the, into the um, soil in our residential landscapes. I'd also like to chime in and uh, we usually suggest that people choose to place their water gardens in places that don't flood to contain the species within the water garden so when there's a flood your water garden species aren't distributed for you into uh, storm drains and stuff like that. Uh, one last question and uh, this is more of a general uh, question so I think all could answer. Um, We've had several people asking about what would be um, the most important thing to keep in mind when designing a small water garden or container garden. Um, there were, have been people who have asked about they have a small ornamental pond and needs to be redesigned and it's like a five by five area. Um, those kind of smaller areas, what do you recommend for that type of an area in terms of a water garden? Well, as far as particular plant species to mix it up, maybe have one floating leaf plant. This is getting into Heidi's area with design. If it's, if it's very small, less, maybe more. Um, go for different textures in the plant leaves. To, and if you can't design the structural component of your garden to have, in some cases, a lot of these emergent plants only want a few inches of water. You can always add that with pots and cinder blocks on the bottom of your pond to lift these plants to the water depth that they're really after. Heidi, do you have any other um, response? Well, I think Greg? the idea of the presentation today was to give um, many options from a native flora standpoint to, to go after, and it's so personal um, once you make the decision to approach a project from an ecological standpoint, then you start to apply your, your personal preferences. Do you like purple flowers? Do you like broad leaves? I think the, the one comment of making sure you've got some plants that have these fibrous roots, if you have an actual shoreline versus a completely lined and controlled situation, that can be really helpful. But also the idea of having just some resting species and, and the sedges, grasses, rushes can offer those breaks and highlight your, your flowering plants all the more and make them all the more special. So the less is more comment, I would underscore uh, what Bob said. Uh, start with a few species and, and see how things evolve for you and instead of getting one of each, that would be something to caution against. Uh, try to get uh, three or five of a sm much smaller number of species to create um, a much more restful and, and lovely landscape. Jill, I will just add, I see a question asking about the decadon verticillatus, the swamp loose, loose strife in its natural habit. It is oftentimes found in very mucky conditions, but we've successfully introduced it into soils that are pretty heavy in clays as well. And so we've been very pleased with that. Okay, great. Um, I think we are out of time. Um, we only had a few other questions, so um, I wanted to, again, thank all of the speakers for their willingness to talk with us today about water gardens and invasive species. It was really an excellent discussion. Uh, this webinar series is supported by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through the U.S. Uh, EPA. I did also want to remind you that our survey URL for the w webinar is in the chat feature. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, 
Also, Greg had mentioned that uh, the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant website will have um, this webinar archived as well as other resources. Uh, thank you again to Greg, Heidi, and Bob and all the participants of this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and feel free to join us again next year as the webinar series continues. Thank you and have a great afternoon. So it looked like 62 was uh, 67. Oh, I, I, did, I didn't see what the final count was. 67. Yep, and they're for standing by and welcome to the Aquatic Invasive Species uh, Series, Science Behind Invasive Species webinar hosted by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network's Organisms in Transit Project. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory and joining me today is Greg Heitzroth and Dr. Ruben Keller. Thank you both for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, take a few moments for the webinar viewers to get you familiar with the technology. Uh, during our presentations, all of you will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentations, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, use the drop-down list to all panelists, and I will collect and pose your questions out after each presentation. If time allows, towards the end of the hour, we will uh, continue to ask more questions. Also, if you have any technical questions at any time, please feel free to ask using the chat feature. We have uh, nearly 100 participants on this webinar, a great diverse group representing individuals and programs from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentations and we should have great Q&A sessions. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the presentations. Uh, please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill that survey out. So uh, without any further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Greg Heitzroth from Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. Greg has been leading the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant's OIT or Organisms in Transit Great Lakes Restoration Initiative project for the past year, which focuses on outreach programming for aquarium 
hobbyists and water gardeners. Prior to this appointment, he was with the Chicago uh, Botanic Gardens for three years working with citizen scientists. We are delighted to have Greg here today to begin the webinar by providing an overview of the aquatic invasive plants. Now, Greg, I'm going to unmute you, and I am going to hand over uh, the presentation ball to you. Uh, you should be unmuted, and you should also have the presenter ball. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I just wanted to do a quick overview in the context of these webinars. Uh, so the topics in today's webinar will cover what it means to be an aquatic invasive plant, um, how potential invasiveness is measured through a risk assessment, and methods for preventing the spread of organisms from water gardens to public waters. Uh, the topics for the next webinar are coming up on the 20th, so that's this Thursday. We'll cover principles of water garden design using native species and examples of commonly used invasive plants in water gardens and some alternatives. Um, so these webinars, just to give you some context, uh, in April this year, uh, we did a workshop um, about the prevention and preventing the introduction and spread of aquatic invasive plants into public waters through uh, water gardens, and this was held at the Chicago Botanic Garden. And the purpose of this webinar series is to broadcast informa information presented at the Chicago Botanic Garden Workshop um, to a Great Lakes-wide audience. And uh, this uh, series was funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And with that, I will start into my first presentation of the day, so an overview of aquatic invasive plants. Um, and so uh, aquatic plants, uh, much like terrestrial plants, uh, have certain requirements, um, so nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, light, water, carbon dioxide, um, oxygen, and space to grow, so just some physical space. And really, um, this uh, graph on the right-hand side of the screen, um, let me see if I can get this pointer tool to work. Yeah, so this graph right here um, pretty much is saying that photosynthesis is occurring, um, so carbon dioxide is going in, oxygen is coming out when there is a light source. So this is a, a light source. Uh, I think this is supposed to be an aquarium um, diagram, but we could think of uh, this as being the sun uh, for all intents and purposes. When there is no light source, uh, typically what's happening is carbon dioxide is moving out um, and the plants are using oxygen. And so this is going to make sense. Um, a few more slides, but for now, just hold on with me um, as I get through some slides and talk about aquatic plants a little bit more. So uh, for water gardeners, um, aquatic plants usually mean shallow water um, plants. Um, so like uh, what we see as uh, marginal plants, so plants that grow in moist soil to shallow water, uh, leaves and flowers mostly above the water surface. And so they're rooted in um, the soil, and typically things like cattails, like I think this diagram is kind of showing, um, are a good example of that. Uh, Free-floating plants, so um, these little guys here on the surface, uh, submerged roots and are unrooted to the sediment, and so they're free-floating. So free-floating plants is a very apt name. Um, and typically some examples of this are water hyacinth and water lettuce. Uh, rooted floating plants, uh, fleas, uh, Leaves and flowers typically above the water. There's also submerged uh, leaves, um, and it's rooted in the sediment. So these are examples of water lilies and um, lotuses. Okay, and then uh, submerged plants or oxygenators. Um, they're also called. Are typically generally uh, underwater. Uh, they have above water um, reproductive abilities, but often all vegetative pieces are below the water. And so that's uh, just a quick overview of aquatic plants. Um, so we're really talking about invasive species, so aquatic invasive plants uh, in this case. And so a quick definition, um, uh, the one that I like, uh, is that invasive species are essentially species that are occurring outside their natural geographic range, um, introduced through human uh, uh, release, um, either intentional or unintentional, and potentially cause ecological or economic harm. And I'll go through each one of these a little bit more. So what do I mean by nat natural geographic range? Um, so essentially, most species have a natural uh, distribution um, across the country or wherever. Um, and then there are barriers to that distribution. Um, <clears throat> some barriers can be large examples like oceans, mountains, deserts, or Niagara Falls, as, a, as an example. Uh, but they can also be a little more subtle as temperature and salinity. Um, so like salt water. So I like to imagine uh, 
the ocean being a good example of a barrier to freshwater ecosystems from Europe to the United States. So a species being transported from Europe to the United States has a very large um, salty barrier of the ocean to uh, transport across. And so really, we're now thinking about um, how that species is being transported across those barriers. And so there's some paths of introductions. Um, and so really, a lot of this presentation is going to focus on water gardens. But there's also aquariums, shipping industry, boating, and fish stocking, such as um, game fish and aquaculture involved in introduction of uh, organisms. Um, and the success of invasion is sometimes based on unchecked growth. So essentially, uh, these species are being introduced into new locations where they don't really have the, the competition of their old habitat or um, natural geographic range. And so you're seeing. Uh, a lack of herbivory and or disease, um, not really controlling those populations as they would in their natural um, areas. And so really, once these species are in um, these ecosystems, they can have negative consequences, such as reduced species diversity. Um, they can compete with native plants, and which is especially a big problem for threatened or endangered plant species. They can change animal community interactions, as well as plant community interactions, degrade water quality, increase buildup change sediment chemistry and impede water flow and movement. Um, and then there's also the economic impact, such as impaired recreation, so boating, fishing, swimming, et cetera, uh, changes in flooding regimes, uh, decreased property values, uh, such as having a pond in your backyard or a lake in your backyard full of um, weeds, and so no one wants to buy weedy property. Uh, create habitat for mosquitoes, reduce waterfowl habitat. Um, and then the ever-present removal costs, which can sometimes be uh, quite uh, extraordinarily large, such as an estimate of um, $100 million annually for each year um, in the 1990s for removal of aquatic invasive plants, and then $29 million in Florida um, between 2008 and 2009. <clears throat> so I just uh, gave a lot of information really quickly, and I'm going to go through a lot of that information in the context of um, uh, examples, and so I'm going to give you three examples of uh, aquatic invasive plants. So, purple loosestrife, water chestnut, and hydrilla. Um, and so, purple loosestrife is a marginal plant. Um, water chestnut is a rooted uh, floating plant, and hydrilla is a submerged plant. So, purple loosestrife is um, introduced from Europe. Uh, there's a few. Um, uh, suspected cases of how it was introduced. Uh, it was definitely introduced as an ornamental in the 1800s. Uh, there's also some speculation whether or not it was introduced through livestock, like the seeds were hanging out in uh, the fur of livestock, um, or even through the shipping industry of shipping seeds accidentally from Europe. Um, this is a very robust plant, um, so I can see why it's being used as an ornamental. So. Um, there's been documentation of it growing up to 10 feet tall, having 50 stems. And the seed production, this is a very large uh, estimate. It's probably the largest one I've seen, but it's about 3 million seeds per year. I've seen estimates in like 10,000 seeds per year. And so generally speaking, it just produces a lot. Of um, it likes to grow in pastures of shallow water, so it grows across a wide variety of habitats. Um, so it makes it pretty aggressive in multiple uh, habitat and spreads uh, through seeds mostly, but it can also reproduce vegetatively. And this uh, distribution map up to the right, um, the darker colors are not necessarily indicative of a uh, higher quantity, but it's more like a, a fine scale mapping of the population location. So like New Mexico doesn't necessarily have a light blanket of um, purple stripe all over it. So this is just a general distribution of where the species are. Our species is. Um, and so that's the basic background of the species, but the economic, I mean, ecological um, problems associated with it could be things such as a loss of high quality bird habitat. Specifically, it competes with um, native cattails, reducing um, uh, suitable um, nesting for those birds, uh, reduce plant diversity so it does compete with other plant species um, and is pretty aggressively choking out other species. Uh, can change sediment nutrient uh, timing. So it decomposes very uh, early compared to the native species. So it's decomposing and producing uh, nutrient input uh, in the fall versus 
what you'd see with most native species producing um, nutrients in the, the spring. And so these changes in uh, nutrient timing sometimes affect things such as uh, tadpole survival, um, changes wetland function, so sometimes it can overtake areas that are typically open water. Um, and then there is annual loss of, of approximately 200,000 acres of wetland each year um, estimated. And so uh, the economic costs uh, have been estimated at about $48 million a year. Um, and so this is uh, a couple of factors that are involved in this number, uh, such as control cost, uh, loss of forage, and then also waterfowl, waterfowl habitat loss. Okay. And then uh, the next example I have is water chestnut. <clears throat> And this is uh, of European, African, Asian um, ancestry. So uh, it's an ornamental from 1877 introduced into, uh, I believe it was Harvard by a botanist there. Um, it is a, I think it was cultivated for food in East uh, India and China, but um, it's not the, what we consider uh, water chestnut as in like um, American Chinese cuisine. Um, that is actually uh, Eleocharis uh, delsis. And so it was introduced as an ornamental species for water gardeners. Um, it's, uh, it likes shallow water, um, also very still water. Uh, it's been recorded to grow into uh, 15 feet deep of water, but mostly likes about 6 feet, so it is pretty shallow. It's an annual species and reproduces through a four-pronged nutlet with barbs. So this is the barb. Um, I'll point this again in a few minutes. Um, the distribution of the species is mostly in the northeast, but there's a lot of effort to... Um, <clears throat> oh, it uh, seems like... Um, is there... Oh, okay, so people are having a hard time hearing me. Okay, well, um, so most of the distribution is... Um, on the northeast coast, uh, there's a little bit of concern about spreading in, into other areas, and so there's quite a bit of watch programs, quite a few programs for watching uh, the spread of the species. And so there's species identification cards, I believe, through um, Sea Grant. Um, I believe it may have been Minnesota Sea Grant. I may be wrong on that. So, um, so Trap and Nutans um, also creates a dense surface canopy. Um, the light penetration uh, can be reduced by about 95%, which is really pretty high. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, this can be related to uh, a depletion of oxygen. So remember that photosynthesis example that I mentioned before. So when there's no light uh, really penetrating these uh, submerged species below um, water chestnut, are typically taking on um, oxygen without producing it, and so there's a uh, general depletion of oxygen below um, the water chestnut. And this can impact invertebrates and fish, um, but there's also a lot of biomass it produces, um, which has other effects. So it's about 17,000 pounds of dry biomass per acre, so that's once you remove all the water. Um, um, that's kind of a lot of biomass. Um, <clears throat> So it also adds to sediment loads, um, increases turbidity and eutrophication, so essentially makes the water less light penetrable. Um, and then there's also lower, lower forage value for waterfowl um, from the species than other native species, and so it's not as good of uh, eating potentially for the species. It so makes bad, bad food. So, um, it also has the economic impacts of a loss of recreational activities. Um, so this barb uh, potentially is very painful to step on. I've never done it myself. I don't really care to do it um, or find out if it is really all that painful, but apparently it's very, very sharp. Um, but also it can reduce boating, swimming, and fishing as well. And so the cost of removal is quite high. Um, here are a couple of examples of that specifically. So over 20 years in Lake Champlain, cost nearly $5 million to remove uh, water chestnut. And then the Potomac River, this is a little older example. And this is um, for inflation, uh, adjusted for inflation to the modern day um, equivalents of dollars um, for the removal of Potomac. So, and then the final example is Hydrilla versalata 
also known as hydrilla, which was introduced um, from Asia. It's a submerged species or an oxy oxygenator. Um, it's typically considered a, an aquarium plant, um, and I believe that's what it was introduced for. <coughs> but often um, it's, well, I should say, sometimes it's a contaminant with common water garden plants as well. Um, so sometimes you'll get additional species than what you actually buy. Um, it can spread vegetatively through turions, uh, these little vegetative uh, bubbles that occur in leaf axles, um, but also through uh, tubers, which grow loot in the roots. And I believe it's uh, estimated about 200 tubers per square meter in which one plant can produce. And so that's a lot of tubers. Um, the distribution seems to be mostly in the southeast, um, but it's starting to occur into the, um, <coughs> the upper Midwest. Um, so it can also grow in very deep water where other plants cannot grow. Um, so typically speaking, it can grow up to 20 feet um, below the surface, where most native plants usually remain around 8 feet. Um, the kicker is that 80% of the biomass that it does produce is 1 to 2 feet from the surface. So essentially, it shades out native species. Annually in Florida, it costs about $15 million to control. And then there's a annual loss of revenue through recreational value, agriculture, flood control, and residential property values. And so just a quick summary. Um, so aquatic invasive plants are what we're really talking about. So um, they cause ecological or economic harm. Um, they typically come in through outside natural, ge their natural uh, geographic ranges. And typically this is done through human activities resulting in intentional or unintentional release. And I think that's all I have for my presentation. So I guess questions or whatnot. Hey, Greg. Uh, I think we have time for one question. And then we'll try to do a couple questions at the very end. Uh, we had one question dealing with uh, whether or not hydrilla is also called the parrot feather. Um, no. Uh, parrot feather is a different species. That's a Meriophyllum uh, aquaticum. Um, and Hydrilla is Hydrilla um, versalata. Um, though I believe parrot feather is of growing concern. So I have seen it for sale in a few retailers recently. OK. Um, we'll uh, save a couple of the other questions that uh, you have gotten. Uh, toward the end of the hour, if that's okay. Um, what mm -hmm. I'd like to do now is I would like to uh, introduce our second speaker. Uh, Ruben Keller is the assistant professor within the Department of Environmental Science at uh, Loyola University in Chicago. Dr. Keller studies the transport, establishment, and impacts of non-native species. Most of his his current work deals with the development and use of risk assessment tools to identify invasive species that are being introduced through trade. Dr. Keller will be presenting assessing the ecological risk of aquatic plants. Uh, Dr. Keller, I, you already have yourself unmuted, and I am going to give you the ball. All right. Hi. Well. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Jill. Um, so again, I'm Ruben Keller, and I'm a uh, in well at the end of my second year of a professorship at Loyola University Chicago, and I'm going to be talking today about uh, risk assessment for non-native aquatic plants. So what we've just heard from Greg is a really nice, clear description of the reasons uh, that there are very many invasive aquatic plants out there that we don't really want in, in the Great Lakes ecosystems. So there are plants that we want to keep out. And the flip side of that is that there are a lot of plants that we, that we don't mind coming in. There are a lot of plants in the aquarium trade and the water garden trade that pose very little risk of harm. And in fact, they're, they're beneficial for us because, because they add value to the trades and people like to buy them to have in their aquaria and to have in their water gardens. So the challenge for ecologists, and as Jill mentioned, this is something that I spend a lot of my uh, intellectual capital on, um, the challenge for ecologists is trying to figure out the difference between those species, between those species that are likely to be harmful invaders and the species that are likely to be benign. And if we're going to do that usefully, then we need to do it before they arrive. Uh, because as Greg mentioned, the costs of 
uh, eradicating aquatic invasive plants are enormous. And in fact, most of the time, we just can't do it. Uh, most of the time, by the time that we find an aquatic invasive plant that's established, it's too late to get rid of it. So there's real uh, value then if we can try to predict what's going to be invasive before it arrives and try to keep it out. And this leads to this idea of what we call risk assessment. And this uh, diagram here shows uh, the invasion sequence. So as we run down this wedge, uh, you can see that at the very top, there's what I refer to as the species pool. And these are all of the aquatic non-native plants that are not in the Great Lakes. Some of them are blue. In fact, the larger portion are blue, and those are the benign species. And then there are some that are red. Those are the species that have the potential to go on to be invasive. Some of those are transported into the Great Lakes, uh, often through trade, which is what we're talking about today, um, and we call those introduced. Some of those introduced species begin to reproduce, so they form self-sustaining populations. We call those species established. And then uh, some of those established species spread and have some of those negative impacts that, that Greg's just been talking about. And those are the species that we call invasive. And you can see, obviously, that that red wedge of species makes it all the way to the end. So the challenge for ecologists and the challenge that, that I guess I've set myself um, is trying to figure out what are those red species uh, and trying to figure that out before they're transported here. So trying to look at that very top line of species and figure out what belongs to the red and what belongs to the blue. And if we can do that, um, and this is exactly the same diagram, of course, but uh, this is annotated slightly differently so that, it applies, so that it applies more closely to the trade in aquatic plants. So if we can look at, uh, the goal is to look at the, all those species that are available in trade or in various catalogs, and then we want to prevent those, those invaders, the red species, from being purchased and delivered into the Great Lakes region because once they arrive, they can be planted, their population can grow, and then they can take over the landscape and become invasive. So risk assessment is looking at those species that are not yet here and trying to figure out which ones pose a large risk. Okay, so taking a step, uh, a step back, um, I've been working on this project over the last, actually about eight years. Um, we've been looking at trying to develop a risk assessment tool for aquatic plants in the Great Lakes. Uh, more recently, this has been done through a pro project funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative titled Preventing Invasions from Trade in Live Aquatic Organisms. We're not just looking at plants, we're also looking at fishes, mollusks, crustaceans, amphibians and reptiles. So we're trying to develop risk assessment tools for all of these taxonomic groups. Um, and you don't need to remember everyone who's working on it, but it's a, it's a large collaboration. We have people at Notre Dame, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Nature Conservancy, Sea Grant, um, and uh, even Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada. Uh, so all of us have been, have been working on this project. And this began about eight years ago when uh, there were two fairly high profile and high impact invasions in Indiana. Uh, this is when I was a graduate student at Notre Dame, so I got involved with uh, Doug Keller and Pat Charleboy. Uh, Doug Keller from the Indiana DNR, Pat Charleboy from Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. They were very concerned about these new invasions of Egeria and Hydrilla, so they put together uh, what, what came to be known as the Indiana Aquatic, Plates in Tra Aquatic Plants in Trade Working Group. This had 25 members. We met every couple of months, and it included members from, from the industry, uh, from universities, from NGOs, um, and from other places. So we first began working in 2007. We were meeting every couple of months. Um, and one of the things that, that surprised me when I went into it um, was that we were all pretty much on the same page about this. I imagined when we got into this project that there'd be a lot of animosity between people like me who were saying we should be keeping plants out and people from the trades who obviously have a very strong economic incentive to keep plants in trade. Um, but we were able to operate by consensus. Everyone agreed there are plants out there that we don't want in trade and it's just a question of figuring out what they are and keeping them out. 
So that led us to begin putting together this risk assessment tool and we decided to begin that with a tool that had already been developed in New Zealand, the New Zealand Aquatic Plants Risk Assessment Tool. And what we did over the period of years is modified and tested that tool to apply it to the, uh, to the Great Lakes region. So there's been a lot of work done on this. Uh, Krista Gantz, a technician at Notre Dame, has put in uh, um, at least two and a half years' work. The tool has been tested on almost 200 species. Um, we've found that it works so well in the Great Lakes that we've also developed it for use in Florida and at the uh, whole U.S. State scale, the 48 states. Here in the Great Lakes, we've now tested all non-native established species, um, and this is already in. And this is this is very gratifying for uh, for those of us who've been working on it. Um, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources recently applied uh, or recently banned, recently regulated an additional 28 species based on this work. Um, it's strongly scientifically rigorous. Uh, there's been a huge amount of work go in, and that's what I want to uh, to describe now. So to give you a better idea of how we can how we can try to accomplish this goal of discriminating between uh, invasive and non-invasive plants. So the aquatic weed risk assessment, that's what the AQWRA means, aquatic weed risk assessment. To complete the weed risk assessment for any given species, you need to answer 38 questions. Uh, and there are 12 different categories. And those categories are listed here. So. You've got to know something about its uh, climatic tolerances and its distribution, whether it's been invasive elsewhere. Um, and then you need to know quite a bit about its biology and ecology, because those are really the things that make a plant invasive or not, the way that it acts in the presence of elevated nutrients or low light, things like that. Um, so I won't go through each of those categories, but you've got to answer 38 questions from these 12 categories. Uh, to do this for a plant species, depending on the species, it takes from about 4 to 20 hours for any given plant species. So you answer those 38 questions, and each question, uh, the answer that you give corresponds to a score. When you get to the end, you sum, you sum those scores, you add them all together, and you come up with a total score for the plant, which ranges between 3 and 91. And then the challenge that we had, uh, once we'd done this for a whole lot of plants, was to look at the data and then figure out what's the correct threshold to use, uh, somewhere between 3 and 91, so that we can say if a plant scores above this threshold, it should be considered invasive. If it scores below, it should be considered non-invasive and safe for trade. So in order to do this, um, we had to uh, look at all of the species that have become established in the Great Lakes in the past. We were using history as our guide to what's invasive and what's non-invasive. And we divided those up into three groups. Um, and I'll give an example of the comparison between uh, a major invader and a non-invader here. Uh, but we also had a group called a minor invader. So a major invader is something that's uh, been in the Great Lakes, done a lot of damage. A minor invader is established uh, but not harmful. And a non-invader is a species that uh, was introduced uh, but that failed to become established. So I'll just show some comparisons here for comparing a major invader, Eurasian water milfoil, with a non-invader, uh, Japanese milfoil. So question 7.1, um, and, and again, this is just one of 38 questions, but it asks whether the species uh, is capable of vegetative reproduction. You score it on a 0 to 5 scale, where 5 is, Basically, yes, it can, it can do great things with vegetative reproduction, down to zero, which is no vegetative spread. So you get this question, you've got the species that you're interested in, you go to the literature, um, various books, online sources, um, and for these two species, we discover that Eurasian water milfoil, Myriophyllum spicatum, uh, is very good at growing vegetatively, while uh, Myriophyllum uh, Aguraeense uh, is, is, is somewhere in the middle. It gets a score of three. It can do some vegetative reproduction, but not a whole lot. Another question, question 12.1, which asks about the invasiveness of the species elsewhere. So uh, has it been invasive elsewhere? 
Again, you have a, uh, we score it in this case from zero to five, and you can see the scale there where five is, is the most invasive. It's a harmful weed in many other countries, all the way down to zero, which is it's not uh, established elsewhere at all. In this case, again, Eurasian water milfoil scores higher, getting five points. It's a very widespread aquatic invader, um, while the non-invader here uh, get zero points, no evidence of naturalization outside of its native range. So that's examples of the types of questions that, that get answered. Again, there are 38 questions. Um, so we've been through and done this for 83 non-native aquatic plant species that have been introduced to the Great Lakes. Um, so again, we divided these up into three categories. And we're looking at history here. We're using history as our guide to what might happen in the future. So those three categories are major invaders, uh, established species, documented ecological impacts. Minor invaders are established, but no serious impacts. So that would typically be species that are established, but that no one's out there trying to control. And then there are non-invaders, species that uh, have been introduced, uh, but that have failed to become established. So from those 83 species, we had uh, over 50 families, and we had a range of growth forms. So we tried to select these species to make sure that we were really testing across all of the biodiversity of species that can be introduced to the Great Lakes. And this shows, this is really the data part uh, of what I'm presenting today. These are the results. Um, so I'll start with the x-axis, which is the bottom horizontal axis, uh, which runs from the 8 to 10 out to 71 to 86. So those are the scores of individual species. And if we then go to the y-axis, that's the frequency. Uh, so each one of these bars, for example, that very first green bar, uh, tells us that um, there were four species, that's the frequency, that got uh, invasiveness scores between 11 and 14. Uh, and all of those species were non-invaders. If we go to the other end, uh, we can see that there again were uh, four minor invaders that got uh, in the top range of scores, and it looks like uh, six major invaders that got in the top range of scores. So, uh, so that's what this graph shows. Um, so the really cool result for us is that, as you can see, the non-invaders, the green bars, are generally grouped very much towards the left-hand end. Uh, the red bars, the major invaders, are generally grouped very much towards the right-hand end. They're scoring higher. And the yellow bars, the minor invaders, are generally grouped in the middle. Now, you'll also notice that this is not perfect. Uh, there are some green bars towards the right-hand end. There are some yellow bars out at the right-hand end. Um, and there's quite a bit of overlap as well between non-invaders and minor invaders. So what we do is imperfect. Uh, we can come up with these, uh, with these predictions. We know we're not going to get them right all the time. Uh, but what this figure shows is that actually most of the time we do a pretty good job of discriminating between invaders and non-invaders. And in the context of what we're trying to do, which is explain what's going on in these very complex ecological systems, uh, we think we're actually doing a, doing a pretty good job. So then you've got to go in and ask, what are the correct thresholds to use? So at what point do we draw a line and say, this is what history's told us. Based on that, we're going to draw a line and say anything in the future that scores above this threshold will be kept out. Anything that scores below will be allowed in. Now, if we treat non-invaders and minor invaders as the species that we're prepared to have come in, and major invaders as the species we want to keep out, then the threshold that we should go for is 57. And that would mean that we correctly uh, assign 91.6% of all of those species. So that's if we decide that we're prepared to have those non-invaders and those established species that don't have impact. Uh, the other way that we can split these data is if we say, well, we don't want minor invaders either. They become established, and even though we don't currently know that they're invasive, we might be concerned about them becoming invasive in the future. 
Uh, if we group those together with non-invaders, then we have these, uh, these four thresholds, 31, 32, 34, and 35, so basically all very close together. Um, and if we use those thresholds, then we get an accuracy of 84.3%. So in each case, uh, this tool works really well, actually. We can do a really good job of discriminating between invaders and non-invaders. Uh, and of course, at this stage, what I've shown you is just looking at history. Uh, but if we can do it so well, looking at what's happened in the past, there's really good reason to be confident that if we apply this risk assessment tool to species uh, that could be introduced in the future, that we should expect it to do very well. Okay, so in conclusion, this tool which is based on, uh, it was developed for, the, for New Zealand, we've modified it for use in the Great Lakes, and it, it has very high accuracy here. Um, so we believe that it can be used as a predictive tool um, for, uh, for prioritizing which species should be allowed in, which species should not be allowed in. Um, and also, when we find new invaders, we believe it can be used as a tool to have a look at them. So before we know uh, whether they're going to spread and have impacts, uh, we can go and assess them. And this tool can give us, uh, I think, some quite good information about how, how vigorously we should pursue control of those, of those very new um, established species. As I mentioned, uh, this, is, this tool has already been used to support new regulations in Indiana. Uh, we're working with every other state across the basin um, to try and help them to learn about the tool um, and to encourage them to, to see its value and hopefully to start using it. And we think that if we can get a coordinated response across the basin, so all or at least most states beginning to use the same sort of tool to decide what should be allowed in trade, um, then we can keep a lot, of, a lot of nasty invasive species that would otherwise arrive in the future. Uh, we believe that we can keep them out. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, we have gotten uh, several questions, so let me um, get to a few of those. Um, one question was dealing with, uh, Ruben, your slide 13. Uh, this person wanted to know what were the non-invader and minor invader species that scored very high? Yeah, I don't actually, um, I should have that in front of me, but I don't. I could, uh, I could look that up. Um, and actually, I'll be able to do that, look that up while, uh, while Greg gives his uh, second presentation, and, and I could... Uh, I could enter that in the chat. Um, what I remember when we looked at those species, they were species that had either uh, not been in trade for very long, so it's possible that they just hadn't had much chance to become established yet. Um, so they might not have truly belonged to that to that non-invader group, um, as in we might not have quite enough information yet about about how they'll act. Um, but it's also, and as I said, it's entirely plausible that this risk assessment tool works for most species. We've shown that it works for most species. Um, we shouldn't expect it to work for all species because we're dealing with extremely complex dynamic systems, both in terms of the ecosystems being invaded uh, and in many cases uh, in terms of the actual species coming in. They, they arrive and they begin to, to evolve and they can change. Um, so I, I will look, uh, and I'll try and figure out what those species are. Hey, great, Ruben. Actually, there's another question, since you'll have that out, if you don't mind also, someone asked about uh, the score of water lilies, um, specifically found in the inland lakes in Wisconsin. How, how did they score? So if you I don't will, mind, as well. I will look that up. Great, great. Another question that we had was, um, is it possible to develop a screening tool for all of the U.S. so that we can stop them from coming to the U.S. and be moved around in the states? Yes, we have done it. We published it uh, quite recently in a journal called Proceedings of the Oh, sorry, Public Library of Science 1, otherwise known as PLOS 1. I can uh, send you that, 
paper, Jill, and you might be able to post it with the rest of these documents when they go up. Yeah, um, that would yeah, the the short answer is yes. We've we've applied this tool at the scale at the U.S. Uh, and it does very well. Um, the question becomes somewhat political then, uh, because if they're going to be prohibited from coming in, then that means that the USDA, so the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, would need to begin regulating plants a lot more proactively. In fact, a lot more actively. Uh, including proactively uh, than it has historically done. Um, so, but there is a tool out there. If the USDA wants to use it, it's been developed and we've published on it. Okay, great. Uh, one uh, last question before we go on to uh, Greg. Um, if a plant is banned, how does that preclude someone from purchasing it by mail. Uh, I, I, I'll jump in here. Um, we have been able to work with a lot of uh, plant suppliers um, who, who who send things around by mail, and at least at some of those internet outlets now, uh, they will not let you purchase plants that are that are banned for sale in in specific states. So if you're in Wisconsin and you go to try to purchase Species X and Species X has been banned in Wisconsin, uh, then at least some of those internet providers now uh, will have a little pop-up saying, we're sorry, we can't sell that to you. Um, that's by no means all of the providers. Uh, there are hundreds of them out there. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done on that, but there is some progress being made. Uh, but that's certainly a case where it would be much, much better to have strong federal regulations prevent things coming in. Because once they do get into the U.S., it is, it's, it's very difficult to stop interstate trade and transport. Okay, great. Thanks, Ruben. Um, I think just uh, because of time here, we'll uh, save the, uh, the few other questions that we had gotten to the very end. Um, Ruben, I am going to, if you're fine with that, mute you, and Greg, I am going to uh, hand you uh, the ball here. Okay. All right. Okay. You should have, you should have the ball. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species next, um, specifically through water gardens. Um, so this was a list of activities um, uh, suggested by the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force. Uh, I believe this list of activities is still being refined a little bit, so this may change, um, but I believe this is the most up-to-date uh, list of um, ways of preventing the spread of aquatic invasive species from water gardens. So um, the guidelines are uh, set up for all steps of owning a water garden. So this includes when you are thinking about constructing a new water garden, uh, when you're adding plants, and when you're doing maintenance. And so this slide is just kind of uh, showing the structure of what my uh, talk is going to be like a little bit. So when you are constructing a new water garden, um, pretty much what we were saying is that uh, people should choose a location away from natural waterways and flood-prone areas. Um, and this is essentially to help ensure that plants and animals and water gardens will not be carried into local streams, ponds, lakes, or results of heavy rainfall. Um, I had a great picture that I wasn't allowed to use, but I'm going to describe it anyhow. It was a mother and daughter um, in northern Texas fishing their koi out in the middle of the road from flooding. And so um, this is pretty much just thinking about trying to reduce the amount of introductions through potential flooding of uh, water gardens. When you're adding plants to your water garden, uh, we're suggesting that people purchase from licensed nurseries. Um, many jurisdictions require that a license be posted. If a license isn't clearly visible, ask an employee about their licensing. And each state is slightly different for how they license uh, nurseries. So Illinois is different from Indiana, uh, for example. Um, choose regionally native or non-weedy plants. Um, 
So essentially this will reduce the amount of plant removal, um, so essentially the weeding of your water garden uh, needed to maintain the garden. Uh, this is kind of going along the lines that they go well in the environment in which you're putting them into, um, while also reducing the risk to near nearby waterways, um, should any plant be moved by wind, animal, flooding, et cetera. And so it's really reducing the number of introductions of potential new species for invasion. And so this is kind of based off of um, the risk assessment tool in which uh, Ruben just talked about. Uh, and so this is a, a list of species that were potentially invasive. Um, and so I should say this is a brochure that we're starting to develop on um, this whole uh, slide. So on the right side, this is a list of uh, potentially invasive or known invasive species um, provided by that risk assessment tool. And then we worked with uh, some individuals at the Chicago Botanic Garden to come up with a list of alternatives. So pretty much what we're going to do is create a, a brochure suggesting alternatives to potentially invasive species. And currently this, uh, this brochure is being refined. So we hope to have this um, being distributed through organizations and retailers um, within the next few months here. Um, and so um, the next step that we suggest people do is uh, when you do buy those plants, uh, rinse the plants in a bucket before planting. Um, so essentially remove old dirt and any detached, uh, attached debris, including other vegetation, animals, or insect eggs before planting. And then go ahead and dump that bucket um, of water onto dry land and not into storm drains. Essentially, this will help to uh, keep unwanted plants and animals from being accidentally introduced into your water garden and keep these same organisms out of the storm drains that might lead to natural waterways. Um, so when you're doing your maintenance, um, <clears throat> check that the, your water garden remains isolated from natural waterways in areas of flood. So if it's been a while since you've installed your water garden, try to consider um, what Greg, I think we lost your audio. Greg, are you still there? Greg, I may have you just uh, call back in again uh, just because your audio has been lost. Uh, what we may do now, um, Ruben, if you're available, is uh, possibly uh, have you answer a few more of your questions? Hi. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, Greg's going to come back on here in a second. If if you wouldn't mind answering a few of the uh, other questions that we had gotten during your presentation. Sure, I can do that. Great, great. Um, we had another question. Um, someone had asked, given the devastating impacts of major invaders, can we afford to use a model with a near 10% margin of error what are the precautionary principles that would prevent new introductions until the species are proven benign in their new locations? Yeah, so that's um, that's really a policy question, and I'm really a scientist, um, so I can talk a little bit about the uh, about the implications of that approach. Um, as an ecologist, it's very, very hard to say that any species is completely benign. Um, so it, if we were to take that approach, the approach that, um, uh, I guess, guilty until proven innocent, then proving that something is innocent is uh, very, very difficult. Um, so what that would effectively mean is that the vast majority of non-native aquatic plants would be banned from trade. And if that's something that was acceptable from a management and policy point of view, then, then that would be fine, um, and we could forget about my risk assessment. Um, the, the reason being that 
that we'd be banning just about everything. We don't really need a, a complicated risk assessment tool to, to do that. Um, what we hear from the uh, state and federal managers that we work with is that this sort of, um, this sort of error uh, that, that we produce is, is acceptable um, as long as it keeps the trades running. So that's kind of the, that's the, the stimulus that keeps us going, uh, preparing these risk assessment tools. Uh, but certainly, if it was a if it was a policy decision that we want to avoid all harmful invasive species in the future, and that was our number one overriding priority, um, then then absolutely we should be uh, keeping these species out and using the precautionary principle to say we just can't take uh, we just can't take this level of risk. Okay, thanks, Ruben. Um, so sorry about another that. <laughs> Oh, so this oh, is great, Greg. Great. I, Back. Yeah, okay. really sorry about that. <laughs> I have no idea what happened to my phone line. So. Hey, okay, um, do you want to uh, continue on your presentation? And Ruben, we can just uh, do a few more of your your questions after Greg's presentation. Sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just about done it anyhow. So this will be quick. <laughs> uh, so where was I? All right. So um, essentially what we're saying with this slide is that uh, uh, removing unintended plants that colonize your pond, uh, so essentially weed your water garden. Um, a plant that moves into your pond and becomes established is likely an invasive species. Uh, it should be removed and disposed of properly. Um, so yeah, so essentially just weed your water garden. Um, once you are disposing of your uh, plant, uh, we consider uh, freezing unwanted plants in a sealed plastic bag and dispose of them in the trash. The reason why we're promoting this over um, composting is that because seeds and other prop, uh, reproductive plant parts uh, may remain viable uh, through the um, composting process. And then uh, finally, uh, what do you do with the animals uh, that you have in your ponds uh, if you no longer want them, like they're too big or they're sick? Um, we pretty much suggest that contacting a pet retailer, animal shelter, or other water gardener um, to exchange those species. Um, if your animal finds a home with another water gardener, uh, make sure that it won't be released into the environment um, in the future. So just containing that species inside your water garden or a friend's water garden. If uh, euthanasia is an option, we highly suggest that you consult a veterinarian before taking any action. And yeah, that was it. So. <laughs> OK, uh, great. Uh, uh, let me see. I was let me ask a few more questions that we had gotten. Um, another question, and this was uh, during uh, Ruben your presentation. Uh, would the use of screening tools by USDA save the U.S. lots of money in cleanup costs? And if so, have the scientists educated in congressional educated scientists educating the congressional members about this are teamed up with those that will. Yeah, so this, um, one of the other things that I do is I work with economists to try and figure out exactly that question. Um, if we start to pull species out of trade, then there are costs for trade, but there are benefits in terms of avoided harm, in terms of we, we avoid the harm from, from future invasive species. So I've been involved in a couple of efforts with economists to uh, to look at those questions, um, at least from work that's been published so far and from all the work that I've done. Um, it's completely unambiguous. We should be using these risk assessment tools. It produces uh, really quite small costs to uh, to trade because it turns out that they're actually it's quite a small number of species that, that become invasive uh, compared to the total number of species in trade. So it produces small costs for trade, huge benefits in terms of avoided impacts. Um, and yes, I work uh, quite closely with some people at the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and work up through their chain of command trying to get to the, uh, to the policy nerve centers. Um, and I've spent, I've been out to DC a couple of times to talk to congressional staffers about this work. Um, so yes, there is an effort going on to uh, to educate people about uh, about the risks from invasive species and the benefits from using risk assessment. 
um, to date, that has not had a huge impact. Um, and we can all think what we like about the political process and the reason why that hasn't had a huge impact. But, but we're hopeful that over the next couple of years, uh, we will see some much more enlightened uh, policies coming out of D.C. Okay, great. Thank you, Ruben. I think those were all the questions that we had uh, for Ruben. Um, a couple other questions for uh, Greg. Um, someone had asked, uh, do any aquatic invasive plants cause harm to public health? Um, <clears throat> there's uh, some links. I mostly found anecdotal um, links to that, such as uh, water chestnut has sometimes been implicated in drowning death. Um, Mosquito um, uh, habitat is definitely associated with uh, human health in some situations. Um, and I guess uh, flooding, when you think about flooding of, um, uh, uh, I guess, changing the flooding of wetlands um, and like purple leaf strife, uh, if you consider flooding a human health problem, um, when you have like sewage backing up and such, um, that could be a potentially a health problem. But those are the only examples I know, and I haven't really found any um, quantitative uh, explanation of any of those. So. Okay. Uh, and actually, I did have one more question for uh, Ruben, um, and this might be also a question for Greg, too. Uh, we had one person asking, they had said that they have been trying to control the spread of Phragmite grasses here in Door uh, County, Wisconsin, and was very surprised when they were traveling in the Lake District of England and discovered that they were trying to reestablish Phragmites in their lakes. The question that they had is, can we learn from the fact that their plants have not survived to find a way to control their growth here? Hmm. This is this is Ruben. Um, I'm sorry, but. I don't know the exact details in that case, um, but the short answer is, uh, in many cases like that, yes, we can. We need to, um, once species become established here and we decided that we want to control them, uh, then we need to know as much as we can about about their ecology and their biology and any natural uh, enemies they have in their native range, um, be those natural enemies, fishes or birds or uh, snails or viruses or something like that. Um, so although I don't know the, the specifics of that case, uh, absolutely yes. Once species become established here, if we're going to start spending money to control them, uh, then it's obviously hugely beneficial to know as much as we can about those plants uh, so that we can design the most effective controls. Okay. Um, another question uh, someone had was, uh, dealing with, uh, are there any native alternatives to hydrilla? Um, uh, let me see. There are a few suggestions from the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, let me see if I can link this up real quick, what they suggest specifically. Um, so this is uh, Ruben. I'll jump in. Um, the first thing is you probably don't want hydrilla in your water garden no matter what because it will take over your water garden. Um, if what you're looking for is a submerged plant that produces uh, good amounts of oxygen for your fish, then there are plenty of alternatives uh, that are native. But I'll defer to Greg who uh, I think has a better knowledge of the actual uh, species that are available in trade at the moment. Yeah, let's see. Um, there is some suggestions of Elodia canadensis, um, the Lacerriana americana, and Potamigian uh, pectinatus. Um, so these are American waterweed, wild celery, and sago pondweed. And these came from uh, suggestions by Chicago Botanic Garden people and also the Department of Environment, um, formerly in Chicago. Okay, great. Um, we have um, one one last question uh, dealing with people were asking whether or not they'll have access to that aquatic WRA list. 
Uh, and I, so I just wanted to double check, uh, Greg and Ruben, I know you were both going to supply some resources. Um, if you could possibly send those to me and we could get the uh, WRA list along with Ruben, I think that publication that you had mentioned, uh, that would be great. The, only, the last thing that I wanted to find out was, um, Ruben, if you had had an opportunity to look up those, uh, those species that a couple of the attendees were asking about. Yeah, I haven't been able to find uh, the identities of those that are um, the, uh, the non-invader and the minor invaders that ended up at the right-hand end, but I'll be able to look that up. Um, we had two... So, Water lilies is kind of a, um, a funny group taxonomically. Uh, a lot of things are referred to as water lilies without being true water lilies. But we had at least two uh, things that are commonly called referred to as water lilies that we, that we tested. Um, and I might uh, butcher the, the Latin names here, but Uriali ferox, which got a score of 19 and um, the other one was Nymphaea candida, hardy water lily, which got a score of 17. So those were both generally down the uh, lower end of the scores. Okay, great, Ruben. Um, one one uh, last question is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get as many questions in as possible if people don't mind. Um, regarding the risks of public health, um, have any exotic species of, and I'm going to not do a very good job, Apicea have been included in Ruben's analysis. This was in the Q&A in the bottom area. Um, A-P-I-A-C-E-A-E. -E. Um. And that's the genus? Oh, that's uh, the family, APACE, so it's the carrot family, I believe. Um, so, like, so um, let, yeah. Let me do some searching. Okay, great. Um, well, I think we're, we're actually out of time, so... Um, any of the follow-up questions that we have, we'll get out to uh, everyone. Um, I did want to, uh, again, thank the speakers for their willingness to talk with us today about the science behind invasive species. An excellent uh, discussion. This webinar series it was supported by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through the US EPA. I also wanted to remind you that our survey URL for the webinar is in the chat feature. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, thanks again to all the speakers and all the participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and feel free to join us as we continue this webinar series on Thursday with uh, Building a Better Water Garden. Registration is still open and is in the chat feature. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Greg. Uh, again, it was a great uh, webinar. We really appreciate it and everyone have a great afternoon.